In studying magnetism, one of the things we've learned is that current, electric current flowing through a wire, produces a magnetic field around the wire. We've got this hand wavy rule, hand wavy, ha, huh? a right hand rule, right hand wire rule, where you put your thumb along the wire and then your fingers curl around that wire showing the direction that the magnetic field circles around the wire. And so if I were to ask you, what magnetic field does a long straight wire produce at a point P above the wire like this, if I've got a current I flowing through the wire, current is taken to be positive, of course, then you could use the right hand wire rule and say thumb along the wire, my fingers are outward, I expect a magnetic field out of the board at that point. To do better than that, to be able to verify that direction and calculate the strength of that field, we need to use the Biot-Savart law, which tells you how each individual piece of the wire contributes to the overall field at that point. Now, in principle, we know in our hearts that this is really a calculus problem, that I should take the limit as we break up the wire into infinitely small little pieces and add up all those contributions. But for clarity, I want to do an example where we look at those, this wire and we break up this long wire into pieces that are pretty decently sized. In particular, just to keep it simple, if my point P is a distance R away from the wire, I'm going to break up the wire into chunks that are length R over 2, half the length, uh, half the distance to point P as chunks of wire. That's my plan. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the Biot-Savart law, which tells me, for if I were to number these, I don't know, I could, I could number them, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll call this one 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 going on, so I guess... It's a little weird. I'd call this one 0 and minus 1 and minus 2 and minus 3 and so on in that direction. But if I number them all, number all these pieces, then if I add up all the little DBIs, all the little contributions to the field due to each one of these segments, that should be a decent approximation to the overall effect of the total wire at point P. It's not perfect because to be perfect we want to break it up into you know a million little you know, segments of R over a million or R over a trillion or something. But keep it simple. We've got this story. We're going to break it up into these R over two size chunks and see what happens. Now, it takes a long time to do this even so. I mean, infinitely many chunks, right? Let me show you how we do the calculation for one specific chunk. And I have chosen that over here to be this one that I've labeled minus two. And I want to know what is the contribution of just the, the flowing current through that little piece, that piece of wire, its contribution to the magnetic field at point P. That's the goal that we want to accomplish, and then I'll tell you what happens when you add it all up. So, okay, uh, doing this, I want to use the Biot-Savart law to figure out the contribution of that piece to the overall field. And here's this formula, mu naught over 4 pi times dli over r squared times i cross r hat, lots of symbols in the formula, right? We're going to write our final result as a multiple uh, I want to write my answer. I want to write my answer as some number times the constants and things. In particular, I'm going to write it as a number times mu naught over 4 pi times current divided by distance. That's what I'm going to do. R, capital R here, is the distance. It's not a resistance. Sorry if you have done you know, circuit problems, things that are different, but uh, I'm going to write it as some number times this. That's my goal in this. And so to be able to do all this, I need to figure out what these pieces are in my story. So mu naught over 4 pi, that's this constant I'm going to pull out. I know in my heart that mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th newtons per f squared. Fine. But we're just going to leave it as a constant for now. Uh, DLI is... Well, in calculus speak, that would be an infinitesimal little length. But since I'm breaking this, a bit, breaking this up into these finite size chunks, my DLI is just the length of my little chunk. That DL, I'll, I'll make a note of that, that DL, uh, my, my I is minus 2, is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm doing I equals minus 2. Uh, my DL, minus 2, is, well, they're all length R over 2. So that, that DL up there, I know what to do with it. R over 2 is the, is the length. For this, for this distance squared, the RPI that shows up in the bios of R law is the distance from this segment to that point. Now, if the segment were infinitely small, it would be a point-like segment. We don't have that. We have a finite thing. So I'm going to measure the distance from the center of my segment 
to point P. That vector there is R to point P from point I, I guess from point minus 2 in particular. Uh, that's my R vector from my source point to my measurement point. That's what I'm setting up. And so I have to figure out what is the length of that vector. That's this denominator here, right? Is the length of that vector. Well, let's see what we got. I, this is a right angle, by, sort of by definition. We, we did that by definition. So I've got a right triangle here. The length of that thing, my magnitude of r to point p from point minus 2, is going to be Pythagorean theorem. Well, this side is r squared. That's the, the vertical side. And this side, each one of these chunks is r over 2. So that's r over 2 plus r over 2 plus half of r over 2. So that's r plus r over 4. That's 5 fourths r squared. Okay. This distance is what I'm saying here. This distance must be 5 fourths r. Right? Half plus half plus a quarter. Okay, so that's this length, and I guess I can multiply this out. Um, r squared, kind of a pain doing this, right? Uh, check, check my math, but I'm going to get r over 4 times the square root of 25 plus 16, 35, 41 is what I'm coming up with here. r over 4 times the square root of 41 is the answer that I've gotten for this length. Uh, that is approximately 1.601, uh, 1.6008 times my distance r. So that's that's what this or that, that's what this diagonal is. Is that whole distance there? Okay, cool. So that is that is my distance. So okay, pieces in this equation that I have taken care of. The mu naught over 4 pi, I'm just sort of keeping. The dl, I know what that is, that's r over 2. Now I know what that distance is. I guess it's that the r squared there is this thing squared, so r squared over 16 times 41. Uh, this piece, okay, let's look at this. What is the current flowing through this piece? Well, my wire is going that way. The same current flows through every piece of wire. So this is just my current i flowing in the rightward direction. I guess I could call that plus x if I really wanted to, but I don't want to. I want to call it just the rightward direction. So this is my current i going that way. I guess that means I know what i i is. Uh, what about r hat? Well, visually, I know that visually r hat is just a unit vector in the direction of p. So I can think of r hat as being, well, that's not the right direction. I can think of r hat as being just this r hat pi, it's just pointing that way. It has length 1. And so I know, roughly speaking, what to do with that. I, I know what it means, at least. So what I really need for this last term, I need to understand that cross product. What am I doing with this cross product of the current with r hat? Let me remind you of cross product stuff. Uh, the, what I know is for i cross product r hat, the direction is given by a right-hand rule. Direction by a right-hand rule. The original cross-product right-hand rule, that, that's the right-hand rule we learned first. I put my fingers along the i direction. Right? i is going this way, so I put my fingers along the i direction. I rotate my wrist until when I curl my fingers, they curl toward the r-hat direction. So, curling there. There we are. This way. So, the direction is out of the page, out of the board. So, out of the board. That's the direction. So the contribution from this little segment is entirely out of the board. That's what we have going on. And for the magnitude of that cross product, for that magnitude, well, how do I want to write that? That magnitude, I know it is the magnitude of the current, which is just the current, uh, times the magnitude of the unit vector, every unit vector has magnitude 1, times the sine of the angle between the current and that r hat unit vector, the, the sine of that angle. Okay, I don't know what this angle is. I guess I could compute the angle, but let me actually point out, I know the opposite side of this right triangle. This is the angle, right? This, this is my theta between the i and the r hat. 
that's my theta that I'm looking at. I know the opposite side is r. I know the hypotenuse is this thing. This is my hypotenuse. And so I can just write sine. I know that sine of theta i r hat for this case is going to be opposite divided by the hypotenuse, which is this thing, uh, r over 4 times the square root of 41. So in other words, the r's cancel out, and I just get 4 over the square root of 41. If you want a number for that, I think I calculated that somewhere. Uh, that is 0.6247. So this is about 0 0.6247. Uh, is my sine of theta in this case. You could do this in lots of ways, but I, if I see a right triangle, I like just doing opposite over hypotenuse just to do it. So, okay, that's my sine of theta. If I put this all together, then, what happens when I put this all together? Uh, I know putting it together, let me get back to my black marker here just to follow this along. I know putting this together, I will get dBi vector is equal to, okay, that mu naught over 4 pi I'm just keeping as a constant up front, just for reference, mu naught over pi up front. The dli is my length, that is r over 2 is the length of my little segment. I'm dividing by this length, this distance squared, so that squared is r squared over 16 times 41, right? Okay, that's that piece. This piece is just i times that sine of theta times i times 4 over the square root of 41 and my direction, this is a vector, so the direction is out of the board, I don't know what to call it, out of the board hat, I don't know what to call it exactly, but it's out of the board, that circle dot means out of the board, we're going to stick with that. So okay, um, one factor of r cancels with the squared there, so I can rewrite this as mu naught over 4 pi times i over r, that's what I sort of wanted to write it in terms of, that was my goal, was to write this in terms of these sort of constants and, and given values of the problem, that times, what's all this mess? Uh, multiply by 16 over 16, that gives me 8 times 4, 32, 32 divided by 41 times the square root of 41 is 41 to the 3 halves power, uh, and out of the board, by, uh, the, uh, out of the board hat, whatever that is, and I guess that's my answer. Uh, I can put in a number for that. Uh, I get 0.12189, so I get mu naught i over 4 pi r times 0 0.12189. That's the number, oh, and of course, out of the board. Okay, so that's the contribution of this one piece to the magnetic field at point P, and you can probably you can probably see that we could do this over and over, right? We could do this for the next segment, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. You could do this for all those segments. If I do that for just the segments shown, from this one labeled minus 3 to the one labeled 4, so 4 in each direction from the center. If I do that and I add them all up, right? If I say, okay, I'm going to do dB for minus 3 plus dB for minus 2, plus dot, dot dot plus db4, if I add up those eight segments, their contributions, you can convince yourself that they're all going to have the exact same out of the board direction. Each one of the segments contributes the exact same direction, so the vectors all add perfectly. We don't need to worry about vector components or anything, it's all just out of the board. They add up perfectly. When I add it up, that means I'm going to have mu naught i over 4 pi r, they're all going to have that factor, and then when I add that up, I do 1.791. This is times 1.791 uh, out of the board hat, I guess. 1.791, that's what it comes out to be, you know, you can imagine the 0 0.12 there, points negative 1 and 0 and 1 and 2 are going to be closer to point P, so they're going to contribute more, point negative 3 and 4 will contribute less, but I get this about 1.8 times this mu naught i over 4 pi r. If I were to do all of them, right, if I were to go all the way from, put this in a different color, uh, if I were to go all the way from db 
minus infinity plus dot 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 plus db, <laughs> that's not a b, plus db plus infinity. If I added them all up, they would still all be out of the board. And when I added up, I did this. Uh, I used a computer to do it, rather. I didn't do it by hand. Uh, I got mu naught i over 4 pi r times 1.99994 out of the board. Uh, that's very close to 2, right? And in fact, you may have already seen, you've probably seen the result in your textbook or something, uh, you, you probably already know that if instead of breaking this up into segments of like r over 2, if I had actually done this as an integral of db, integrating over infinitely small little dl's, breaking this up into infinitely small pieces, this isn't actually a bad integral to do. You can handle it. And if you do this integral, you'll find that you get exactly b equals 2 times that. So mu naught i over 4 pi r times 2 out of the board. Or in other words, mu naught i over 2 pi r out of the board. That's the magnetic field you'll come up with. And I guess it's kind of satisfying that we get to this point where uh, that, that our summing up of individual little pieces can add up and get something so close to the true integrated continuous result. It's pretty cool. And that's how we come up with. That's, that's how we find our total magnetic field. Obviously, breaking this up into a million in a, even smaller pieces would be better and would come even closer. Probably I could have broken it up into bigger pieces and still come reasonably close. But this gives you an idea of how the Vios of Art Law works. You do each little piece, you do the calculation, and then you add them all up. That's how you find the magnetic field due to a wire. And if the wire wouldn't put some funny shape, you just add up all those little directions, all those little pieces. They just wouldn't all be in the same direction anymore. With that, that's the end of this example. I hope that helps you understand how the Vios of Art Law works.